Hello. And in this spooky bad influence today, we'll be looking at some ghostly games for Halloween, including an exclusive preview of Jack in the Dark. Stick with me if you want to talk fluent Klingon, fly with the next generation, and boldly go where no Trekkie has gone before. Up a bit, down a bit. We'll be showing how you can play games simply by talking to them. Our main review is Jurassic Park on the SNES. Afraid of the dark? Scared of things that go thump in the night? Then close your eyes and ears, for Bad Influence is about to take you through some of the creepiest games around this Halloween. Like this one. The full motion video version of Seventh Guest. You play a super sleuth, one of six people invited to an eerie mansion awaiting the arrival of the mysterious Seventh Guest. The house is, of course, haunted, and only one of the guests will survive the night. But... It won't be available until December. <laughs> Enough of him. The sequel to the graphically unusual and extremely creepy Alone in the Dark is out in January. It's got a new star called Grace, who's got her own mini-game to introduce her called Jack in the Dark. Grace is an eight-year-old girl. Goes out on Halloween trick-or-treating. She knocks on the door of a spooky toy shop and gets locked inside. It's being packaged with the original game, Alone in the Dark, when it's re-released this Christmas. Right, then. Take a look at this. Another exclusive for Bad Influence. The first ever showing of Alien Breed 2. There's more sound in the sequel, including synthesised speech, which really sets the scene for 17 levels. Nine different types of aliens chase you around the labyrinth of corridors, laboratories and war zones. And it's really scary, I can tell you. <laughs> Are you scared yet? Well, the inhabitants of Weirdsville are. They've been overrun by zombies, giant ants, and killer babies in the latest monster mad romp on the SNES, zombies. The entire town's been overrun with ghouls, and the whole world's gone wacko. More fanged madness as I, Dracula, hit the PC. In this latest blood curdling role playing game, you search for the fanged master through graveyards and cemeteries. There are werewolves and skeletons in here, too, and they're all in on the act, you know, all of them. <laughs> You're wondering what all this over-the-top Dracula impersonating is all about. It's because earlier this year, Andy was digitised into Mega CD version of Dracula the Game. He was videoed against a blue screen, then the techie Fertlers cut him out and produced a game sequence with him as the star. The good news is that Andy's acting career really took off after he did that blue screen stuff. The bad news is that he got left on the cutting room floor. He's not actually in the final version. It's been loosely based on the recent film of the same name, with you playing Jonathan Harker, vampire hunter extraordinaire. Keep your wits about you as Dracula can change into a gargoyle, wolf, or an old vampire master. Ugh, pretty horrific, even without Andy in it. Ah, hello, spooky furtless. I'm not scared of ghosts at all, which is lucky because the shed is haunted. The ghost of Great Uncle Nam, who was a pirate captain in the Caribbean, is said to walk on or about All Hallows' Eve. <laughs> but like I said, I'm not scared at all. I'm planning to stay the night here. I've got uh, my camera to snap the ghosty dude, and I've got uh, my ham sandwich, yes, and uh, uh, my torch, and uh, I've got a um, uh, 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 baseball bat in case the going gets tough. Right, on with the first cheat. Now this is for Lemmings 2 on the Amiga. All you have to do is click on save and then on cancel. Then on the main screen, click at the top right hand corner of the screen, the bottom right, the bottom left and the top left. And then when you start to play, you'll notice that all the levels for all the tribes have been opened up for you. Ha! Oh, yes, very good. Right, ghostly dude, take that! Who are you going to call? Not me. Our main review is Jurassic Park on the SNES, which is launched a week tomorrow. It's interesting because it's been made in surround sound. That's a technique that allows the sound to come from all around you. You may have experienced it in the cinema. You know, like when a plane is supposed to come over your head and the sound starts at the back and then goes down to the front? That's surround sound. 
To experience it at home, you need a special television like one of these. It's got stereo speakers left and right. But the clever bit is at the back. There's more speakers left and right for the surround sound. Most films these days are made in surround sound. And some television programmes too, including this one. So, uh, hello if you're watching in surround sound. You'll know if a programme's being made in surround because you'll see this little logo before the programme begins. So that's surround sound, but what difference does it make to the game? Well, in Jurassic Park, it enables you to think, feel you're really there. And you can hear things coming from behind you like that dinosaur! Oh, no! Take that, Johnny T-Rex. So, what about the game? Well, it's completely different from the Mega Drive version we reviewed a few weeks ago. The SNES game's a shoot-em-up with a strong strategy element. You play Alan Grant, who has to complete nine tasks before he can leave the raptor-infested island. The Game Boy and NES versions are also due out. This is the handheld. No surround sound here, though. Here's Adam with the SNES version. I was expecting this to be another Bill Film license, but after I actually took time to play it, I found it was actually surprisingly good. To be certain of killing the hoverfly, you need to use a bowler snare rifle, which is one of the range effect weapons. The, another one is the gas grenades, which I've just collected there. In order to make the raft go across the stream, you've got to shoot that turnstile over there using a shotgun or a similar weapon. Jump across here, and anyway, there are two styles of games here. You've got the overhead style, which you see, and there's a first person view inside as well. Out here, you spend a bit too much time wandering around looking for stuff, but it's quite good. To get to your style of gameplay, you need to enter any of the buildings. This is a visitor centre. In each building, there's a task. Here, you've got to reboot the computer, but you've got to have done other things first, like reset the power and find people's ID cards to get into the rooms. The rocket launcher, which I'm just about to use on him there, see ya, will destroy enemies totally, leaving no trace, whereas some of the other weapons, such as a gas grenade launcher, leave them lying where they fall. For those who need an excuse to play the game when they should be doing their homework, when you pause the game, Mr. DNA from the film comes out with useless pieces of dino trivia. This game will take you ages to finish, so you get plenty of play out of it. If you want to get an exploration game, then you want to get this. It's a massive game with loads of options and excellent gameplay. Even if you're fed up with Jurassic Park by now, you'll still love this game. And so the final scores for Jurassic Park. Both the boys and the girls gave it an above average 4 out of 5. Vet dudge, act dudge, Liji. If, like me, you're a Star Trek fan, and you'll know that that was Klingon for, your spaceship is a garbage scow. If you don't speak Klingon, you need the official Teach Yourself Klingon tape. It's part of a whole range of toys, clothes, videos, and books, all based on the series. But true Trekkies don't just want to view, read, and listen. They want to be on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, boldly going where they have not boldly gone before, and now they boldly can. American games company Spectrum Holobyte are producing computer and console versions of Star Trek. This is the Super NES version. So, how does the game play? And remember, this is an early version. Okay, well basically it starts off with your uh, hail by this doctor. She's on a planet and she's being harassed by some Romulans. So she gives you a location where she is and you need to fly the Enterprise over there. This is the bridge of the Enterprise and these are the different stations on board here. Down here is Astrogation. This is where you'll set up where you want to travel to. So she told us to go to uh, New Coda 6. So we'll quickly go there. Um, here's the turbo lift where you decide what characters you'd like to bring down to the planet's surface. You can choose all sorts of different people. Okay, and we're down on the planet's surface. You can be any one of the four characters you'd like. Um, the idea here is we're supposed to locate some Romulans. We've got, Data's got a, a phaser and a tricorder as well, so you can uh, tricorder things to find out stuff about it. Uh, there's a Romulan, we got rid of him. Okay, so we're being drawn into a space battle. It happens automatically. The upper part of the screen there is a forward view out of the Enterprise, and the lower part of the screen is an overhead view to give you an idea of your, your location versus his. The artwork for all the various versions of the game has been carefully produced to match the style of the TV series and then directly digitized into the computer. At the top end of the market, there will be CD versions of the game. Developing games for CD requires a whole new set of programming skills. Even though we weren't allowed to see any of it, they're also working on the virtual reality version of Star Trek. So you really will be able to boldly go. 
Beam me up. Hey, yo, what's going on? Hey, man, life on board. Z Wright ending his report in a very predictable way. This is a new version of a PC game called Star Trek 25th Anniversary. Fire phasers. Yup, it's voice activated. So, raise shields. Yup, and fire photon torpedoes. Brilliant, it's great fun, but it does require special hardware to be connected to your PC. And it'll only work with programs that are specially designed to be voice operated. But there is a new package called Voice Assist that will let you talk to nearly all your PC software. Before you use it, you've got to teach it to recognise your voice. And that couldn't be simple. You just go into training mode. And here are the commands that you'd want it to learn. So let's try maximise. We click on single. And then I click on OK and say the word. <coughs> maximise. Now we can test to see if it recognises that. Maximise. And up it comes, which is terrific. We'd save that and come out. I've been teaching it words all afternoon, so let's see if it can recognise them. You do have to remember, though, to click in the top left-hand corner here on the ear, otherwise it's not listening, look. Word processor. Winwright is what we call the word processor, and when it comes up, I should be able to get address. And up it comes. Calculator. Calculator. Now, the problem here is that the system doesn't understand what I'm saying. It just understands the words I've taught it. And the word I taught it for calculator was pumpkin. And there it is. It's called a single utterance speaker dependent recognition system, which sounds very technical, but it's not if you think about it. A single utterance is just one word commands to you and me, things like left, right, up, down, enter, and the like. Speaker dependent means it will only recognize the person whose voice it's learned. So if Violet tries to close my calculator, I bet she can't. Close. Close. See? They claim 95% recognition Close. for this, which is pretty good, but it does have a problem Close. in a noisy atmosphere like a television studio. Close. That's enough of the Close. closed show, thank you. You've also got to be careful when you're speaking, because it's constantly trying to analyse your voice and not making any sense of it, so we keep getting not recognised in the top left-hand corner. And when you do say the commands, you've got to be specific. You can't say, calendar, because that's not the way it learnt it. I learnt it like this. Calendar. And up it pops. 7 a.m. this morning. What was I doing? Hello again, Furtless. In the interests of science, I've had my right arm surgically removed and replaced with a voice-activated bionic arm. <laughs> Up. Hey, down. Stop, stop, stop. You have to be really careful what you say, though, because sometimes it goes completely mad. Hey, stop, stop. Sorry, Furtless. It must have been because I said the word mad. Well, stop, stop, stop. Right. Here's my first voice-activated cheat. It's for Met Warrior on the SNES. Pick up controller. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now, all you have to do is pause the game and then type in A-L-L-Y, 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 three times in a row, and you'll be invincible. <laughs> and you'll be able to fight <laughs> without being killed. Stop, stop. <laughs> I didn't mean fight me. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> Namrude, armed and dangerous. Now for this week's news and previews. Back in the 1980s, the classic 3D space game was Elite, and at last there's a sequel. The new version is called Elite 2 Frontier. It took five years to program and is massive. You journey through the galaxy, exploring millions of planets, fighting off aliens and pirates, and trading all the way. It's released tomorrow on the Amiga and PC with an Atari version to follow. Fancy saving a few dolphins? Well, the world's first ecologically sound computer game is being released on three new formats. Echo was last year's surprise hit on the Mega Drive. Now it's available on Game Gear and Master System. Both are faithful representations of the 16-bit version. The new Mega CD version has five extra levels and educational film about dolphins and apparently it's got 3D sound. New chess master for the Game Boy is poised to finally lay Tetris to rest as the most popular cart. The handheld version has 16 levels of play, from novice to grandmaster, a two-player mode, a teaching option, and you can even get hints for the best move to play when challenging the computer. And as if that wasn't enough, it's one of the few Game Boy carts to feature speech. Speed Race is a very popular cartoon on MTV, and now a new game for the PC. You get to pilot the amazing Mac 5, the fastest car ever built, and race around the world, battling villains like the Snake Oiler and the Gang of Assassins. And now for some more games reviews. 
Star Wars is released this weekend and Master System and Game Gear. Not to be confused with Super Star Wars on the snares. Everyone knows the story, so let's dispense with the build-up and go straight to Angela on the Master System. This is an excellent conversion of one of my favourite films. You have to rescue the Princess Leia and you won't stop until you've got her. In the early part of the game, you're playing Luke Skywalker, but as you go along, you can change characters. I'm going across here to go get my lightsaber, but it's difficult. I think the graphics are brilliant, especially for an 8-bit machine. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. If you walk up to him, you can get your lightsaber. I think that's brilliant, is that graphic. It just looks like the character from the film. I'm in the bar here. I have to rescue Han Solo. I have to kill all the aliens. When I rescue Han Solo, I can also play him as well. This is a brilliant game and good value under £30. I'd definitely buy this one. I wouldn't bother with this game. There's nothing really special about it to distinguish it from any of this month's other releases. I thought this was a bit dull. The graphics are good for an 8-bit, but the levels all look the same. And the scores for Star Wars. The girls thought it was a good 8-bit game and gave it an above average 4 out of 5, but the boys thought it only warranted 3 out of 5. F1 on the Mega Drive is the official Formula One World Championship game and it's being billed as the fastest and most exciting motor racing game ever released. Strong words indeed. Here's Sarah to test those claims. You need really good reactions to play this game. It's really fast, especially when you're in the turbo mode. This is the Japanese track which is similar to all the others. There's not a lot of detail in the graphics though. You can change your car according to the track you do, like tyres, wings and so on. Other race games seem slow after you've played this one. When you crash, you slow down rather than explode. Some people like this, but others didn't. At the moment, I'm playing against the Mega Drive, which is a really good option. I'm at the bottom and the Mega Drive's at the top. As you can see, the Mega Drive is winning. This is a fast game with some good options, but I certainly don't think it's the best racing game ever. I really enjoy playing this. It's the best racing game out on console. I'd recommend this to Mega Drive owners. It's really fast and great fun to play. And the scores for F1? The girls gave it a mediocre 3 out of 5, but the boys went up a gear, a fast 4 out of 5 from them. Golf is a very stupid and easy game. And here's how to win at it. Number one, wear stupid big baggy check trousers so that all your opponents fall over laughing at you. Number two, uh, whoops, use a bigger bat. And number three, cheat. Here's a cheat for PGA Tour Golf 2 on the Mega Drive. When you're playing Skins Challenge against the computer, press Start and choose Green from the option bar, then press Start again, and you'll be able to move his ball anywhere you like and he'll miss every time. Ha-ha! <laughs> right, now to practice my swing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Four, three, two... One. Thank you, Violet. If you want to read the data blast, set your video recording now. Last week's competition prize was a Mega Drive with Aladdin and a Bad Influence T-shirt. And the question was, in the story, how many wishes did the genie give to Aladdin? The answer, of course, is three. And the winner is Scott McClellan from Paisley in Renfrewshire. Well done, Scott. This week's prize is a snares with a copy of Jurassic Park, the game. Now, we've been getting so many entries for the competition that to make it fairer, we decided to make the questions harder. So this week's question is, what is the name of the age that came before the Jurassic period? Phone in your answers on 0891 700 100. Calls will cost no more than 25p, but make sure you ask permission from whoever pays the phone bill and lines will close at midnight on Monday. Just before we go, how to turn your Game Boy into a Work Boy. Now, we all know that inside a Game Boy there's a computer bursting to get out and these cartridges could be the answer. There's a personal organiser, a spell checker and even a Spanish translator with over 300 words and phrases for you to wrap your tongue around. So I'm just going to try something on you here, Viola. OK. okay. Habala usted Norvego. Do you speak Norwegian? I think I preferred him as Dracula. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.